Do you know that we live today under a covenant of breath? You realize that? The only creature in this world that God ever breathed his life into is man. God did not breathe life into a cat or a dog or any of the animals or whatever. Only man. And before Jesus Christ left this earth to ascend to the Father, he called the disciples together and he breathed on them. I want to tell you, today we need the breath of God. We need to understand that every breath that you take, you are breathing God. For he fills the universe, not just because of the air that you breathe, but that he fills the atmosphere in which we live. And therefore, the, the most real way by which we can take God into ourselves to become one with him is the fact that we live in the atmosphere of his presence. Yeah. So I want you to turn to the first uh, book of Corinthians, first epistle, chapter 10. And the apostle Paul says to us, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact that all our fathers were under the cloud. Well, we've often used that phrase, being under a cloud, to indicate that somebody is being uh, depressed or feeling depressed, and they're under a cloud. We want to be out under the sun. But you know, if you're traveling in the wilderness, you would be very thankful for a cloud. In the wilderness, you almost burn to death out there. And so the cloud becomes very, very important. The children of Israel, when they came out of Egypt in their liberation, were led into a wilderness. Of course, they had the chance of, of going directly into the promised land within three weeks. But they wouldn't do it. Even though God said, I've given you the land, even though they sent 12 men in there to go and check it out to see whether it was what God said, they came back and said, it's absolutely true what God told us. It's a land flowing with milk and honey and there's everything in there. In fact, it took two men to carry one bunch of grapes out for them to uh, kind of chew on to make sure that they knew what was in there. But you see, even so, they would not go in. So God turned them toward the wilderness. Every one of us have entered the wilderness. This world for us is a wilderness. And uh, there, is, uh, there are so many problems uh, that are issues in the wilderness. But you know, God traveled with them. God traveled through the wilderness with Israel. Every day, never missed. He was always there. When Moses was told to go to, his, uh, to uh, Egypt and to liberate the people of God, the children of Israel, he said to God, now just a minute before I go, I'm not convinced that Pharaoh is going to listen to me. I'm not convinced that, uh, you know, I'm going to be successful in this task. What if Pharaoh will not listen to me? God said, all right. He said, what have you got in your hand? He said, I've got a staff. Well, he said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw his staff on the ground and it became a snake, a serpent. And Moses is backing away because he knows what that thing can do. And so God says to him, now pick it up. Oh Lord, come on. It's a snake. I mean this thing can kill you, you know. And he said, pick it up by the tail. 
Well, if you ever have anything to do with snakes, don't pick them up by the tail. Because those things swing around and they can, I mean, 360 degrees, I think they're on a swivel, but they can do it. And they will bite you. But he said, pick it up by the tail. Well, you know, when God tells you to do something, you better do it. So Moses said, well, okay. And he picked that thing up by the tail and became a rod in his hand again. You know, when Jesus Christ came to this earth, he became the serpent man. When Israel was in the wilderness and the serpents came because they uh, griped against God, said, God, we're tired of this bread from heaven. We're tired of this water coming out of a rock for us. We're just tired of the wilderness. You know, you brought us out here to die. And so these serpents began to move amongst them. These serpents. How many of us have had the experience of the serpents in our journey? The serpents that bring sickness. The serpents that organize circumstances which are set against us. The serpents which cause us great sorrow of heart. The serpents which seem to put a limitation upon our life so that we cannot really serve God. These are the serpents. Why should we have these things? Because we're not always walking in the presence of God. Today God wants to challenge you. It says here in 1 Corinthians 10, all our fathers walked under the cloud. They walked in the shadow of the Almighty. You remember what the angel said to Mary, the virgin? The shadow of the Almighty will come upon you. And the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And that holy thing that shall be born of you will be called the Son of God. We're functioning as Mary today to produce that Christ which is the Savior of the world. That's correct. And so tonight, today, God is wanting us to understand this walk. Uh, I just took notice of the choruses that you were singing this morning and the words which are quite wonderful. But I realized that it's very easy to sing the songs of Zion. It's very easy. It's like the old uh, Western songs, you know, which are mostly about his girlfriend or his wife or something, you know, or even his horse, you know, he fell in love with his horse. Some of them even married their motorcycle, you know, all of this stuff. But it was love, you see. And, and they sang about it, and, uh, and the lyrics, you know, all tell you how much he loved this person and so on. Of course, they could just walk away from them, that didn't matter. So what I'm saying to you today is, many of the things that you sing, the words that you speak, are they just words, or there is, is there a reality to it? You see? It's not what you sing here on Sunday morning, but it's what you live and experience on Monday and Tuesday and the rest of the week. Because I see people raising their hands on Sunday morning like this, and I say to them, what do you do on Monday morning? Do you worship God on, Sun on Monday morning? Or Tuesday morning? Or Wednesday morning? Oh, no, no. Well, because, you know, this is special. So we wait till next Sunday, then we come back and we do it again. Right. Thank you, Lord. Well, at least you get one day out of the week. This is our, our problem. We are walking today, every day, in a wilderness. We're walking in a wilderness. There is nothing in this world to support the life that God has given to us. You understand? There's nothing here to support the life God has given to you. The life God gave to you is spirit. And that life is eternal. 
and there is nothing here on this earth to support that life. The only support for that life comes from another world. So when Israel was walking across the wilderness, there was an atmosphere created by the Lord himself. There was a cloud that followed them, or led them rather. The cloud led them by day, and a pillar of fire by night. So that Israel never walked outside the atmosphere of God. Never. Every day, the water was there. Every day, the bread from heaven was there for them. So that God provided for them everything that they needed. But you know, sometimes we go for several days, maybe sometimes for several weeks, and we have not received from heaven. We have not really plugged into the atmosphere of God. We've missed him somewhere. The cloud's gone that way and you've gone that way. And we wonder what's happened. So today, God is just going to remind us about a few things. It says here, all our fathers passed under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They all passed through the sea. Well, there are three types of baptism here for Israel, because that's what it speaks of. It speaks of baptism. And here in the Red Sea, the children of Israel had just been delivered from the land of Egypt. 400 years of slavery, making bricks for Pharaoh, building Pharaoh's castles and whatever else he wanted to be built. They were slaves. And God sent a man called Moses to release them. When Jesus Christ came into this world, he came to release us from the bondage of of slavery. Yes. Slavery to sin, slavery to our own self, which in fact doesn't exist only in the mind of a man. Because what we are in the natural is not what God created. That's right. We are living as mortal human beings today. God never created a mortal human being. God created spirit. And that's what God knows. And that's what you are. And all of the journey that we are on today is to bring us into the realization and the reality of that spirit functioning as me. Yes. That's what it has to be. Now I can tell you Christ is in every man. And that's the truth. Christ is in every one of you today. Not a little bit of Christ, but Christ, the Spirit, is in you. And because of that, you are expected to live out of that life which God provided for you. But there's another life which seems to appeal to us, and that is our mortality. And that means that we are going to live as a mortal human being. We are born, we're going to die. That's the extent of our life. In our mortality, we suffer from sickness and pain and suffering. And from all these other things, from the deficit in our life of happiness, uh, the problems that come are all heaped upon us. And our mortality becomes something that you groan under. But God said, I've given you life, and that life is eternal. That life cannot have a, a migraine headache. That life cannot get sick, it cannot have cancer. That life can't even die. But for many of us, we have ignored it. I did for 40 years in my life. But God got hold of me, and I began to become conscious of another life and it's that life that I've sought to live from that time on and today that life is becoming every day more real to me 
more real. To get up to expect, Father, you're going to walk with me today. Your presence will be the atmosphere in which I will walk and live. And in that atmosphere, nothing that can, that, that can defile us can enter in, in the presence of God. In the presence of God, in that atmosphere, there is fullness of joy. Any of you sad today? Because you've got some experience in your life that has robbed you of your joy? I want to tell you, in the presence of God, in the divine atmosphere of the cloud, you can walk in freedom and release and be happy. It says they were all baptized under Moses in the cloud. Well, to be baptized under Moses didn't do a whole lot for them because they weren't out of the Red Sea very long before they rebelled against the Lord and the Lord said, here's your land, I want you to go in and possess it, I'm giving it to you, it's yours. And they come back, ten of those spies came back and said, the land is everything that God said. He didn't lie to us, it's true. But you know there's giants in there. We can't take that place, there's giants in there. But God never asked them to take the place. He said, I've given it to you. There is a life that God has given to you it's not something you've got to work for. It's not something you've got to earn. It's not something you've got to study to find out how it all comes together. God has given you. That life is already in you, waiting for you to access it and begin to live out of it. Yes. That's the Christ of your true identity. So they went through the Red Sea. They went down into the sea after God separated the waters so it wasn't a true baptism because the water never touched them but it was a symbol of baptism and water baptism is purely a symbol it's a symbol of a reality but it's still only a symbol so when we go through water baptism unless you are actually in the spirit it will just make you wet. That's all. And that's what's happened to so many of us as we have tried to walk the Christian pathway and, and follow what we believe we had to do in order to receive the fullness of the Spirit of God. So they went through the Red Sea, but it didn't change them. They were just as rebellious as they were before. It says in verse 4, they all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So they drank the water from heaven, because that's where it came from. They, they ate the manna, which was the bread from heaven. That's what God provided for them. And even though they drank that water, and they ate that bread they still had a rebellious nature. It did not change them. Many Christians have come to know Christ, but the change has never taken place in them. What is a Christian? I mean, we still ask the question, why? Because so many people today that say they are Christians are doing stuff that, hey, you kind of want, what's, what's, this, what's going on? Like I say, you've got film stars today saying, I'm a Christian. Why? Well, they gave their heart to Jesus, God bless them. But see, that doesn't change anybody. That's a mental exercise. And therefore, it doesn't change anything within you. So this morning, we're going to look at a reality. But let's just see, there's a little more here about Israel, because the Apostle Paul said, this is not a history book. This is not recorded about Israel just to tell you what Israel did some thousands of years ago. Because he said, you will find that Israel becomes an example for you. Yes, that really we've done exactly what Israel did. Yes. No different. So it says here then, they all drank the same spiritual drink. They drank from that spiritual rock which was Christ. But God was not pleased with them. 
And so he said these things are for examples. Verse 11, these things then happened for examples and are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that seeketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. So we may be able to stand at a moment in time, but not be able to continue standing as we live life today. That's our problem. So what is it? There has to come into our life a reality. The reality for Israel was there. The cloud represented the presence of God. It was the cloud of great glory in which he always moves. It produced for them the atmosphere of God's presence so that none of the nations of the earth could touch them unless God allowed them to. You see, they were walking in the presence of God. The one thing that I was uh, impressed about was when I went to India in 1968 and traveled with a man called Bak Singh, who was a man that had gone to uh, England to study, became an engineer. He traveled here to the United States, was here for uh, several years. And then God said, I'm going to take you back to India. I want you to go back now and minister to your people. So he went back to India. This is the man that God put me with for three months, which had such a, 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 a dramatic effect upon my life. He didn't teach me doctrine. He taught me a way to live and a way to function. That's what he taught me. I would go to bed at night, you know, after the meetings and we'd been talking, it was late, and, and I, I would go to bed and he'd be on his knees. I'd wake up at five o'clock in the morning and he's on his knees. I'm thinking, Lord, I think that man's been on his knees all night. I don't know, but I think so. He was an amazing man. He carried such a presence with him. Just to let you know what kind of a man he was. He went home, of course, from America. He went back home. But he's a Christian now. He comes from the high-ranking Hindu family. So, of course, when he goes back home, says, Pope, I'm a Christian. Well, his father said, Son, you are a have never been born. You are not even going to be registered as our family from this day on. You're dead as far as we're concerned. And you are to leave this home and we never want to see your face again. Well, he expected that, of course. That wasn't strange. But the father said to him, before you go, we're going to have a meal together. And so they prepared this meal, beautiful meal. So they all sat down together and they all began to eat. I'm sorry, one man began to eat and that was Bak Singh. He began to eat and he was enjoying his meal but the others were watching him. They were waiting for him to fall off that chair because they had put enough poison in that meal to kill an oxen. And he just kept on eating until he finished. And they're looking at him. And the father got up and said, Your God must be a powerful God. The whole family was converted at that time. The whole family. You see, he carried the presence. He carried the presence. I traveled with that man for three months. I would love to have stayed there. But I was with him for three months and the impact of that man upon my life was 
dramatic, to say the least. When I came home, I was a, a different man. And that was when the change began in my life, very slowly at that beginning. But that was the first thing. It was so amazing. So we're talking about a real change that takes place in our life. Yes, sir. And I'm wondering today how many of you have experienced that change which actually changes your nature and your character. For instance, I say to people today, do you realize that when I was a young man that I was so nervous, so nervous that I would never, I could never have stood up like this in front of an audience. It would have killed me. I, I was, I had an inferior co complex like you wouldn't believe. I mean, everybody was up there and I'm down here, you know. I'm like the worm and the rest are like the birds flying, you know. That was me. And people say, brother, I don't know. are you telling us the truth? I'm telling you the God's honest truth. You see, my nature, my very character was changed. If, if, I, if I went to, you know, say a doctor's surgery, you know, I almost crawl into that that man's office. Why? Because I felt so inferior. This guy knows so much and I know nothing, you know. And I would just sit there and he would do whatever he needed to do. Have you had God change your character? Because many people suffer from an inferiority complex, which means that your, your concept of yourself is way out of whack. In other words, God made you in the beginning, Genesis 1.26, he said, let us make man. And that man is you. God spoke a word to produce the man. You are the product of a word that God spoke. You're, a pro you're the product of a word God spoke. And whatever God says, whatever he speaks, cannot return to him until it's accomplished what it was sent to do and then it can return unto the Lord. So if you are the product of that word that God spoke, then you are not the person that perhaps you think you are today. You are a, another creation from another world. You are in fact spirit. I want you to turn to the book of Revelation chapter 4. After this, this is John the Apostle speaking. After this he said, I looked and behold there was a door in heaven opened. This morning God wants to open a door for you. A door is an entrance into something. The door not only is an entrance into something but it lets me know that there is something beyond the wall. Yes, sir. Something on that other side. And for many of, of God's people today, they have never known what is on the other side of that wall. And the wall is simply our mortality. It sets up a wall around us, which means that it puts a limitation upon our life, whatever it is. And we cannot see beyond that. John said, there was a door open in heaven. God wants to open a door for you this morning. A door into a world that you have never, never seen. A door into a world that you've not even thought about. Because this earth so envelops us that we think this is all there is. Whatever there is that you can see out there. And of course there are beautiful sights out there. I mean, just driving here through this area of uh, the states uh, is beautiful. Uh, nearly as beautiful as down in uh, North Carolina there. You know, through the mountains. That was beautiful. Uh, driving up over the, uh, uh, the parkway, way up over 6,500 feet you go up there. Just amazing. But see, this world is just this world. 
This is not God's world. This world was made, not created. It was made by the one that came to this earth. All things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. And the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 18, everything you can see with your eyes is passing away. That means this world is passing away to be replaced by the kingdom of God. Well, you see, if you only had half an idea about what the kingdom of God is, you'd say, man, that's what I want. But you're the builders. We are the builders of the kingdom of God. And the earth that we're going to inherit, God bless you, is not this world out here. Who wants to inherit this world with all the wars and all the crazy stuff going on in this world? I don't want to inherit this world. That's why I'm traveling the world as an ambassador of a heavenly government. For that heavenly government is the government of God over this earth. Yes, it is. He's the king. And, and this is what we're about. So there's a door that's being opened to us that's going to let you see beyond this world. Beyond that which is part of the earth's experience that we have. It says here, and when that door was open, he heard a voice. The first thing that will happen in your life when God opens that door is you're going to hear a voice. I am amazed at the number of people when I ask them, have you ever heard the voice of God? They say, well, I can't say in honesty that I have. You mean to tell me that Christ dwells in you? And you remember what Jesus Christ said when Philip said to him, show us the Father and we'll be happy. And Jesus said to that boy, that man, he said, listen, I've been with you three, three years. I've walked with you, talked with you. You've seen what I've done. You've heard what I've said. And you have never seen my father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. The Christ that's in you is God. That's the father. And you've never seen the father. That means you've never seen your true identity. Are you hearing this? That's to see the Father in Christ, because Christ is God. But to hear the voice of God, this is the way by which God said that we should function. Because Jesus Christ is my master, and he set the plan for me. He's the one that showed me, this is how you do it. I believe that when Jesus Christ came into this world, he basically stood up and said, Listen, Pope, this is who you are. I am here to let you know I am God's original man. And this is who you are. You've forgotten. You've forgotten who you were when God created you in the beginning. He said, This is who you are. And that's the reality. But he also said, I'm going to now demonstrate how this man was designed to live. So when you look at the life of Jesus Christ, he made the blind to see. I mean, whatever the little problem was, whatever the difficulty was that had come over mankind in the 4,000 or 6,000 years that have taken place since, uh, since creation, uh, according to the writers anyway. So whatever has happened, we have forgotten who we were back there. We have forget, forgotten that we were spirit when we were created and that spirit is Christ and Christ is God. That's who you are. Now listen, if you had the chance in your life with the many, many issues that come against you, the problem, the financial problems we have in our world today. And in Australia, some men or some people that have saved, they've worked hard and they've saved, maybe they've got a million dollars set aside there somewhere. 
And all of a sudden they find most of it's gone. And men that would have paid their own retirement now are on a pension because their money has gone. Listen, if you could have known that there was somebody living in you who is the reality of who you are, not what you see in the mirror, and that that person has all the wisdom of the universe, you could have said, listen, Father, would you tell me, what do I need to do here? What should I be doing? And you would hear his voice, and he would speak to you, and he would tell you how to solve the problems of your family, or how to solve the problems of your finance, or how to solve the problems of your marriage, or how to solve whatever problems you may happen to have. He has all the wisdom of the universe, and he dwells in you. That means he is capable of communicating with you. Because you see, because he is you, not a little bit of you, you are that spirit. You hear this? Yes, Your body is not you. Right. Would to God that Christians could understand this. We look in the mirror and say, this is me. This is not me. You can't see me. And that's why we had the problem with understanding who Jesus was. Right. See? Because in, Genesis, in John chapter 1 verse 1 it says, In the beginning was the Word. Not the Bible. The Word. The Word God spoke. And that Word was the man. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. That's you. But then in John chapter 1 verse 14 it says, And the Word became flesh and we lost him. We don't know where he's gone now. We don't know who he is. We don't know what he's doing. Why? We can't see him anymore. What can you see? Oh, we can see Jesus. We can see Jesus. And so in our foolishness we began to worship Jesus. Because we didn't know any better. We thought, well, well, that's who he is. He said that he, uh, that I and my father are one. He said, basically, I am God. He didn't say that straight out, but that's what he was saying. You see? But everybody looked at him and said, no, he, he's Jesus. So Jesus is God. I don't think so. Jesus wasn't God any more than Des Walter is God. I know God is in me. I know that is my true identity, but as I stand here before you today, if I said I am God, then I think I'm taking a liberty. But I can tell you, God is in me. God is in me. But he's in a body. And this body, of course, has not yet been totally reinstated in the spirit. But it will be one day. And God's already started. I've got evidence in my body that's already started. And so it is today that we don't quite understand that the voice of God is not something that comes out of the sky because everybody's saying, well I'm listening but I never hear the voice, you know. And then somebody says, I heard the voice. I say, where was, oh it just kind of came out of the, you know, the ether up there somewhere. I said, that wasn't the voice of God. That was another voice, whatever it was. I said, your audio system that you have in your body was never designed to hear the voice from heaven. Never. And I want to tell you something else. You have five senses in your natural being. Sight, hearing, touch, taste, and smell. You really develop your own reality through those five senses. And in fact, you create your own world with those five senses. But the strange thing is that not one of those senses will allow you to know God. None of them. Because they are all senses of the natural body. The natural body has no ability whatsoever to know God. 
even the mind which could become the mind of a brain surgeon or the mind of some great scientist developing stuff that we're not even thinking about today. The great, you know, this mind is such a, a tremendous ability to, to search out knowledge, but it cannot touch or know God. I don't care how smart it is, you see. God has built into you and I another whole system whereby we have recognition of that which is eternal. And that means that that Christ in you can communicate to us very simply, very easily, because he's wired into the whole system of your being. He's wired in. But we don't know that. And we think, it's well, I'll just, I'll just read the book. That's not what God said. You're not to live by the book. You are to live by every word that is proceeding out of the mouth of God that dwells in you. You see? You're not going to find uh, anything in the Bible to tell you when to stop eating. You're not going to find anything there to tell you that's no good for you. You should be eating that. There's nothing in the book that's going to tell you that. You must have that in the voice from the Father. So, there's a voice. That was the first thing when the door was open. I want to tell you, I want to challenge you today. If you've never heard the voice of God, I'm not going to try and tell you how you do that, except by meditation. Psalm 46 and verse 10. Be still and know that the I is God. Be still and know. That's how you will get to know the Father in you. And the reason why many of us will never hear the voice of God as we are is because there's too many voices going on in there. We're listening to all kinds of things. And we've got the internet now. God help us. I mean, there's everything on there from the fairies in your backyard and to everything else you want. It's all on the internet. And I have people, uh, you know, young men, particularly in Indonesia, uh, that I had, you know, helped and, and encouraged in the Lord and they were going well. And then they get onto that internet and they come across all this stuff, this mysticism and so on. And they're headed off, oh, brother, yes, well, they send me pages of this, and I write back, and I say, listen, don't send any more. I'm really not interested. I want to hear what God's saying. I'm not interested in all that other stuff, you see. And, and listen, don't, don't misunderstand me. I mean, I, I'm one that searches. I will search for, for what I believe is truth. I will search anywhere. I, I don't have any hang-ups about anything. But there are such a lot of stuff there on the internet that will just take you off at a tangent somewhere. And you need to know. You need to know. So, the voice is very important. I want to challenge you with this. If you've never heard the voice of God, would you spend time today, sometime, just in the quietness of your own heart, not listening out there for something, but going inward through this door. Because this door is into heaven, and it's not up in the sky. The door is into here. And this is where God wants you to go. Because in here, when the door is open, the voice will be the first thing that you will hear. I want you to spend some time, would you? Would you agree to do this? Mm -hmm. To hear the voice of God? Because I want to tell you, there is nothing greater. You can listen to a preacher, you can listen to Des Water, you can listen to your, your pastor here, you can listen to anybody. Okay, they may be able to help you in some ways, but I want to tell you, it's that voice in here that's going to be the true guide of your life. And then you can travel the world, you can go anywhere you want. And the voice there will be your guide. It will be there constantly. 
So, it also says here, the voice I heard was, as it were, a trumpet speaking, and it said, come up here, and I will show you things that must come to pass, or things that are going to come to stay. I'm going to show you things that are not on this side of the door. They're on the other side of the door. Not a time thing. Not they're going to come in another 20 or 50 years or whatever. And of course you know now that many, many people are waiting for 2012, don't you? Many Christians are waiting for the year 2012. And you will see a build up. It's already starting to build up now. People are starting to reread the book of Revelation now in the light of what we know and understand that in 2012 that the Mayan calendar finished on that date in 2012. That was the end of their calendar so people are beginning to say wow something big is going to happen and the magnetic fields of the earth are going to change north to south and south to north and so on. And so now people are saying this is it. This is the coming of the Christ and yeah. Lord help us. So that's why I want you to be able to hear the voice of God. That's the one that's going to give you the truth. Yes, so it says here, immediately. Immediately that door was opened. He said I was in the spirit. Why? Because you have entered the realm of spirit yes, in sir. here. Our lives are lived externally. And our, our happiness and our comfort and everything else is relative to this world. It's, that's where it is. But you see, when you go into the spirit through the door, I'm sorry, when you go through the door, you immediately are in the spirit. Do you know what it means to be in the spirit? The Bible says that John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. They said, well, that was Sunday. No, no, no. This is the Lord's day, but it's not because it's Sunday, because tomorrow is going to be the Lord's day too. And so is the Tuesdays and the Wednesdays and the Thursdays and the Fridays and the Saturday. They're all the Lord's day. The Lord's day is not a 24-hour day. The Lord's day is the time when you begin to go through that door and enter into the realm of God himself. That's what it is. And immediately I was in the spirit and I saw something. We've gone in through the door into the heavens of our being and the first thing we saw was a throne. We saw the throne. Come on now. What is it that's ruling your life? Have you ever seen the throne which is the throne of God? God ruling over your life? Come on. If God is ruling because that's where the throne is and he says I'm in the spirit now and I can see that throne and of course it doesn't just say I saw the throne. What does it say? It says I saw somebody sitting on that throne. Yeah. This is the Lord. This is the king of the, all kings and he's on the throne in your life. How can you have God dwelling in us? How can we have God dwelling in us and still have all the problems we have? How is that possible? Well, it simply means that the door has never been opened and you've never seen the throne because this is the throne of God. God controls the universe. I've heard so much crazy ideas, you know, from, from some of the preachers that are around, you know, saying that God's not in charge of this world, the devil's in charge of this world. Yeah. Oh, Lord, help us. I want to tell you, God is in charge of this world. Yeah. He owns this earth. He owns the heavens and the earth. He owns it all. Everything in the earth and everybody on the earth. There's nothing he doesn't own. Don't belong to the devil. God is in control of this earth. You say, well then why are the wars and why are the people killing each other and all this going on in the world? Well, it's all having a part to play in this thing we call life 
on the planet. God's still in charge. There is no good and evil in God. Because he controls what we consider evil, but it's not evil to him. There is no such thing as evil in God, right. nor in anything that he does. God is the potter. We are the clay. And out of one piece of clay, he can make a vessel unto honor, and he can make a vessel unto dishonor. He can make one that you would say, this is spiritual, this is good. This one is not spiritual, and it's evil. That's what we would say. God never said that. God said this one is unto honor, this one is unto dishonor. But the one unto dishonor is fulfilling the function of God exactly the same as the one unto honor. Come on, this is reality. You understand this? There is no good and evil. Good and evil is a concept of the, new, of the human mind, the natural mind. That's all it is. It's what we consider, we becoming the judge, we sitting on the throne, determining what is good and what is evil. You see, that's what happens in a lot of religion. Religion is letting man play God. Well, you've got to be careful. You, you must not cut your hair. You women, you're not, not allowed to cut your hair. You've got to make sure your dresses are just this far off the ground. You've got to uh, make sure you're not allowed to speak either. You know, you've got to be very, very quiet in church. And if you want to ask anything, wait till you get home and ask your husband. I mean, he won't know, but ask him anyway. You see, all of this, this is, this is man on the throne. It's got nothing to do with it. God is ruling and reigning. But there is a man on this earth that is going to rule and reign with Christ. And he said, if you will overcome, I will grant for you to sit with me on my throne. Yes, Hallelujah. And that's when we can take charge of our life. I want to tell you, so many Christians are still living in Egypt. And they're under a pharaoh, whoever he might be, whatever he might be. It might be sickness, might be pain, might be suffering. It might be some disease, it might be whatever. But see, Jesus Christ read in the synagogue that morning, remember, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted. He's anointed me to release the captives. He's anointed me to open the prison doors to them that are bound. That's ministry. That's what I'm sent to do. Yes, sir. What am I trying to do this morning? I'm just trying to tell you what God is saying to you. He says, I want to set you free. I want to you to see that door open in here and see the throne of God in you. That throne of God is supreme. In other words, there is nothing that has power over God. Nothing at all. And people still talk about the serpent in the garden. Well, I want to tell you, he's got a squashed head. Yep. Somebody's already put his foot on the head of that thing. Yes, sir. 2,000 years ago, as a matter of fact, the serpent died. And if you think he's still alive, that means you've been fooled. You're deceived. Yes, sir. Isn't that amazing? So... The throne is within me, and there is one sitting on that throne. He is Lord. You sang that this morning, didn't you? Yeah. Jesus Christ is Lord. He is Lord. What does it mean? He's in charge. He's in charge of your life. Well, then you say, well, why have we got all these problems? Because he's not in charge of your life. He wants to be. And the throne is still in there. And if this morning God opens that door for you, you will see the throne in there. But you might not see the one on it. Until God opens your eyes. And you recognize Jesus Christ is Lord. That means he can do whatever he needs to do.
in our lives. And he said, uh, he that sat on that throne was to look like a piece of jasper. You notice there's no image here. There's no image. Why? Because he's spirit. Spirit doesn't have image. That's why God said you're not to make any image of God. No idol. And he says there was a rainbow around about the throne. This little incident here or that, that John talks about, the door being opened, realizing Christ is on the throne of our lives, was designed to set us free. Set us free from our problems, our headaches, our fears of the future, everything. Because if Christ is seated upon the throne of my life, I have nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. He is Lord. And so the children of Israel, they walk through the wilderness. Rebellious people? Yes. Uh, but uh, did they die of starvation? No. Even the rebellious people did not die of starvation. Did they ever die of thirst? No. There was plenty of water for them. How did they know where to go? Well, because there was a cloud that guided them. You see, the one that sits upon the throne is able to guide you through life. Yes, sir. And you will never make a mistake. <laughs> You'll never make a mistake. Because he is Lord. Before you were born, before the foundation of the world, God had a plan for your life. And that plan, he can fulfill for you. And that plan included the fact that you already have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. He said also that he has chosen you. Chosen you. That means by deliberate choice, you are what you are today. By deliberate choice, God chose you to be one of his people. And in that choosing, he also declared that you would stand before him holy and without blame before him in love. Isn't that amazing? Only God could declare that before the foundation of the world. Why? He didn't even wait to see when you, got, when you were born as whether you would, you know, trust in Jesus or not or whatever. He didn't wait for that before the foundation of the world. God had a plan. That means that what you consider to be evil today is fulfilling a function in God. Don't try to work that out with your carnal mind because you will not do it. Because people ask me stupid questions about that. What about, what about Hitler? What about Idi Amin? What about some of these crazy guys? You mean to say God made them to do all that stuff? Don't try to work it out. I'm just telling you that God knows what he's doing. That is my confidence. It is not a question in my mind. I just say, God, I know what you have done and what you are doing is right. Why? Because God is a strange person. He doesn't do things like we do things. God begins at the end. Yes. He establishes the end of everything and then works back toward the beginning. Yes, and I want to tell you, I've read the last page of the book and God wins. Yes, and what is the end of the story? There will be no more pain. There will be no more suffering. Mm -hmm. There will be no more tears. He said, I'll wipe all your tears away. And he said... Uh, I will walk with you, I will talk with you, I will fellowship with you, I will guide you, and there will be no more death. So you see, this is looking through the door. If you can understand this, you are not actually created for this world. 
You were created for another world. Yes. Why? Because you were created spirit. Yes. This is not the world for spirit to actually live in. This world is designed for a mortal human being who needs eyes like this to be able to see things, who has all the faculties to function in this world. But you are not designed to actually live in this world. You are designed to live in another world. Actually, that world is revealed through the door. That when God opens that door to you, you are in the realm of the spirit, not in the realm of flesh. You're in the realm of spirit. It's that other world. That's where God dwells. I'm pointing up, not saying that God's up in the sky. It's above this world. It's above. That's what the word Uranus means, the word heaven. It just means above. Not the sky, but above the atmosphere of this world. And in that world, all the potential of God functions there. Not only all the potential, but all of the... Uh, everything that we need is in that world. That's where the bread of life came from for the children of Israel. That's where Jesus got the bread from to feed 5,000 people. That's where the authority came from for him to stop the storm. You see, in that world, he was walking in that world. That's why this world became subject to him. And this is what God wants to do for you today. This world will become subject to you when you walk in that other world, because that other world rules. God so ordained in creation that the heavens would rule over the earth. That means that the heavens in you will rule over the earth of your being. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Which means that sickness and pain and suffering and all those things, God can deal with. And he wants to set us free. Ultimately, we are all going to walk free if we want to walk in God, if we're walking under the cloud. But you see, first of all, the children of Israel went through the Red, the, the Red Sea. And you would have thought that in that experience that they would have gotten to know God together with their deliverance from the land of Egypt. The greatest military power on the earth in that day, they walked out of there without a, a gun, a knife, a pea shooter. They had nothing. And they just walked out about two and a half million people, it's reckoned. And not even the dogs could bark against them. So you see, there's another world that you can live in. Those people walked out of Egypt, not in the power of this earth, but in the power of the heavens, in the power of God. He delivered them. Then, when they come to the Red Sea, God said to, to um, Pharaoh, well, you're just going to watch them all walk away from you. Why don't you try and chase them? I mean, God did that, you know. God, he's running the show. Don't think that Pharaoh was running the show, because he wasn't. You remember he wanted to let Israel go at one stage, and God said, no, you're not. You're not going to let them go yet. I've got a couple more little tricks to pull on you yet. And so there was, yes, there was those ten plagues, you remember? And boy, that messed up Egypt, didn't it? So in the end, you know, Pharaoh said, okay, get out, because that was the death of the firstborn. Get out, get out. You've caused enough headache for us, just get out. But after they went, God said, Oh, don't let them go. Come on, go chase them. You've got chariots, you've got horses, go chase them. And they did. So Israel walked across the Red Sea and onto the other side and began to sing there the song of Moses, the song of victory. And the Egyptians said, well, we've got you. You boys think you've, you've won? We're coming. And they drove their chariots down there into the Red Sea, into the crossing where Israel went across. And when they all got down there, God just let a little trickle of water come that made it all muddy on the bottom there. And those chariots just bogged down to the axles, 
those dogs and uh, horses couldn't pull those things and they got stuck there and then the Lord said well goodbye and he just brought the, the waters back and the power of, his, of Egypt was broken yes. and the truth is God said or rather the Bible declares Israel never saw the enemies again yep. never saw them again wonderful and so, this is the Christian life. The Christian life is not you doing the best you can with a little help from God. The Christian life is God functioning in you, living his life through this body. Yes, sir. Now I want you to turn back to Corinthians again, chapter 11, 1 Corinthians, chapter 11. I'll just put this together for you. First Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> the earth is the Lord's. In verse 15, I speak as to wise men, judge what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Jesus? What is the blood of Jesus? The blood of Jesus is not the red fluid that was in the veins of Jesus. That is not the blood that cleanses you. That is not the blood that can forgive your sin. That was mortal blood. Whenever the word blood is used in reference to Jesus Christ, it refers to his life. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, he tells you the life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. When Jesus Christ said to the people, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood he was not talking about drinking the red fluid that was in his veins he was talking about receiving his life that's his blood to drink his life means to take unto yourself appropriate his life which is eternal which is not bound by the limitations of our mortality it's got no bounds at all. That life is the life of God. To do whatever God wants to do. But that's all. Not just to do what you might want to do. Because if that was true, and you got mad with somebody, you might be able to just destroy them in a minute. And God wouldn't want you to do that. So, it, that power is available only to do what God wants to do. So it says here, this is the communion of the body of Christ. That's an interesting word. What is the communion of the body of Christ? The truth is, it has to do with a relationship which is as close as your marriage of a husband and wife. If you look at that word in your strong concordance or whatever you will find that amongst many things it says this is like the relationship between a husband and wife the communion of the blood of Jesus we have become so one with him that's what it's talking about to become so one with him remember Paul said in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, he says, He that's joined to a harlot is one flesh. But he that's joined to the Lord is one spirit. Now you've got something. That means we've become one with the Spirit of God. That means that the function of God within us is then. It's the reality of what we are. So he begins to do things. It's the communion of the blood of Christ and the bread which we break. 
Is it not the communion? Is it not that oneness with him? Do you understand what Jesus was on this earth? Everything that God wanted to do on this earth, he did through the Christ of God. It was the Christ of God that did all the miracles, not Jesus. Jesus never did a miracle. And I have seen all the miracles of Jesus in my life and ministry, but I never did one of them. You know why? Because God has never asked me to. Let me tell you how this works. And this is what will put this together for you. Jesus was the body through which the Christ functioned. This is who you are. You are the body. That's what you are. You are the body through which Christ functions on this earth. To become one with him is to understand that the Christ of God is functioning on this earth through you when you become one with him. So, when I have a, a, a something to do, uh, maybe somebody uh, requires a touch from God to set them free from some issue, the first thing I say is, Father, what do you want me to do? I'm the body. Are you hearing this? Yes. You are the body. If Christ is going to do anything in Allendale, he needs a body. He does. And that body is you. Yes. Because this is the only body, this is the only means of manifestation that Christ has on the earth, yes. is a body. Yes. He is spirit. He doesn't have hands. He doesn't have a mouth like we've got. And he doesn't have feet like we've got. Right. So he needs a body. So when Jesus comes to the man at the pool of Bethesda, who's been there 38 years, I can just hear him saying, Father, what do you want me to do? He says, well, I want you to tell him. First of all, ask him, do you really want to be healed? Silly question. No, no, no. Oh, no, that's serious. There's a lot of people that want to be sick. You better believe it. Why? Well, because when they're sick, they're going to get a lot of attention. And some people find quite a lot of help in that, getting, having a lot of help. So, when, when Jesus said, well, what, do you, what did you say you want me to do, Father? I just asked him, did you want to be healed? Well, of course, he said, yeah. Well, of course I want to be healed. He said, okay, just tell him, pick up your bed and take it home, go home. So he said to the man, pick up your bed and go home. And so the man picks up his bed and goes home. And Jesus walks on. Why? Because he's done what he what it, what it was needed to be done. Well, tell me, who healed the man? Did Jesus heal the man? No, sir. Jesus was the body. He needed, the spirit needed a voice. Have you ever given your voice to the spirit of God to say in this world something that could help somebody or that God wanted to do on this earth? Have you ever given him your voice? In Isaiah chapter 40, you remember, the king was coming. And he said, I need a voice. Is there somebody there? And John put up his hand. John the Baptist said, Lord, I'll give you my voice. He said, okay. And he did. And John, he went around saying, the king's coming. Come on, prepare the way of the Lord. The king is coming. He gave his voice to the spirit. This body belongs to God. These are his hands. Yes. Yeah. Every miracle that I have seen in my life and ministry, I never did the miracle, but I was the body. I want to tell you, beloved, can you understand this today? 
because this will set you free and it will allow you to have a part of the program of God. And the problem is that we've all thought, oh, you, God, you want me to do a miracle? You want me to pray for somebody who's sick and, and, and heal them? I can't do it. Of course you can't. But that's what I believed. Even when I was a pastor in the church, I thought that's what I had to do. And that's why I always had a real problem. And so here we are. I want to tell you today, God's not going to ask you to do a miracle. But he wants you to be his body. We are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. When God opens that door for you and you begin to see the throne, you recognize he is the one. He's the king. He is the Lord of your life. The one you sing about with those choruses there. He's the one. But you are his body. He dwells in you. He dwells in you. May God bless you this morning. And help you to understand that so that you might be a vessel in his hand.